soul questions. Is telepathy real? Telepathy is a fancy name for the ability to communicate with another person using just your mind. It sounds like something straight out of a comic book, yet for centuries, there have been those who claim to have the gift. The word telepathy was first coined in 1882 by a British scholar named Frederick W. H. Myers. He was the founder of the Society for Psychical Research, a group dedicated to understanding strange psychic or paranormal events. They were trying to use cutting-edge science of the day to get answers, and telepathy was one of the main paranormal phenomena they wanted to solve. But even at the time, they weren't without strong critics. Many experts criticized the Society for Psychical Research for trying to find proof of telepathy, rather than trying to determine if it was actually real or not. Even still, lots of different people took this new idea of telepathy and ran with it. All sorts of different experiments popped up to try and test for telepathic powers. Take, for example, Zenner cards. They were designed by a psychologist named Carl Zenner in the early 1900s. The cards have five simple distinct designs on them. A yellow circle, a red plus sign, three blue wavy lines, a black square, and a green star. The test itself is pretty basic. The person conducting the experiments shuffles a deck of 25 cards and picks one up, looking at the symbol. Then, the potentially telepathic patient tries to guess which of the five designs is on the card. Easy enough. The problem is, this experiment is an easy target for cheating in the form of sensory leakage. That's all the different ways a patient might be able to tell what's on the card without using telepathic superpowers. They might be able to read the symbols from the back of the cards, or notice small hints in the voice or body language of the person doing the experiment that could tip them off. In other words, this simple experiment doesn't seem to have much scientific backing at all. Other telepathic tests have been tried over the years too, but experts have found major flaws with each and every one of them. For years, it seemed as though telepathy was nothing more than a pseudoscientific myth. That is, until around 2014. That year, a team of researchers used technology to conduct an experiment to try and see if brain-to-brain -brain communication is possible once and for all. It sounds like sci-fi, but it worked. How? Well, they used special electrodes that detect electrical activity in the brain called an EEG. People in India wearing the headset would transmit messages from their brain over the internet to people in France wearing a wacky device on their head called a TMS. Those signals were then emailed from India to France where the TMS headsets would stimulate the person's brain. The messages were sent in binary code, so every letter was broken down into ones and zeros. In other words, it was a bit like slow, clumsy Morse code, sent from one person's brain to another across the globe. Pretty cool, but also pretty inconvenient. Not exactly an Omega-level mutant power, but still, why does it matter? Because there might not be people among us with mystical mental abilities, but one day, maybe even soon, science might actually catch up with the fiction. How do adoptions work? Adoption is a super special process where parents decide to raise a child living without a guardian as their own. It's a legal process that officially makes the adopted child part of the family just like any other kid. Once the paperwork is signed and all the interviews and background checks are made, the adoptive parent officially becomes the legal parent of the child. There's no legal difference between an adopted child and a kid who's born into a biological family. So making it official is a huge step for any family looking to grow through adoption. There are tons of reasons why people might decide they want to adopt. Some are unable to have kids on their own, and others just see it as a great way to grow their family. 
So, while adopted children might not share their genes with their adoptive parents, they are raised with all the same love and affection of any other member of the family. And of course, it's not just babies that get adopted. Kids of all ages are adopted every year. In fact, many adoptions aren't a stranger taking in a baby in need. Lots of kids end up being adopted by someone they already know and love, like a step-parent, relative, or a foster family they've lived with for years. Sometimes an adopted child might decide they want to learn about their biological parents. It's very normal and natural to be curious. Some states and other countries make it easy to find out who they were, and others make it pretty hard. Some never meet their biological parents, or never even have an interest in them. It all depends on the person and the family. Nowadays, thanks to the power of the internet, it's much easier than it used to be for people to search out public information about their biological relatives. Aw, oh, now that's sweet. Why are things sticky? Adhesives are any substance that's used to make things stick together. You can find them everywhere all around us. Some adhesives are more obvious, like white glue, glue sticks, sticky notes, food labels, or stickers. Others are just as common, but maybe not quite as noticeable. Your shoes, for example, are held together by adhesives. So are a lot of the parts inside your electronics. But what actually makes two things stick together? What makes something sticky? Well, it comes down to two basic forces, adhesion and cohesion. Adhesion is the force that causes different things to stick to each other. Cohesion is the force that causes something to stick to itself. The easiest way to see these two forces at work is to simply look at a single drop of water. When you see a single drop of water hang suspended in the air, seemingly connected to a surface, that's both adhesion and cohesion in action. The ability for the droplet to stay stuck to a surface is an example of adhesion, while the ability of the water droplet to stay formed together as a little droplet is an example of cohesion. There's one more key to making a good adhesive. Wetting. Wetting is how much the adhesive can freely flow into the tiny crevices on the surface of whatever you're trying to stick to. For example, when you glue two pieces of wood together, the glue works its way into all the tiny nooks and crannies in the wood, helping the two pieces stick together even stronger. That's why glue is so perfect for sticking two things together. It's sticky enough to be adhesive, holds itself together enough to be cohesive, and wet enough to flow into all the tiny crevices. Some animals make their own adhesives out in the wild too. Mussels use it to stick themselves to rocks or boats. Spiders use it to trap prey in their webs. And plenty others use glues in all sorts of different ways. Nowadays, scientists can perfect their adhesives to be exactly as strong and sticky they need them to be. From super glues that stick forever, to post-it notes or other stickers designed to be removed and reused. So, what makes things sticky? Adhesion and cohesion working together to make substance after substance way too hard to wipe off. Now, next time the peanut butter gets stuck to the roof of your mouth, at least you'll know why. How do vaccines work? Do you know anyone who has polio? How about smallpox? Measles? Mumps? It's unlikely that you do. That's because these diseases have been all but eliminated by those prickly, pointy shots called vaccines we get as kids. Take polio, for example. This infectious disease caused multiple epidemics in the U.S. alone between the late 1800s and the 1940s, when a vaccine was more widely available in the country. Over the last 30 years, polio vaccines have all but eliminated the terrible illness from most of the world. The number of known cases dropped from 350,000 to just 33 in 2018. That's more than 99%. Okay, so that's why vaccines are super important for our health, but what exactly are they? And what's inside of them that does such a good job protecting us from diseases? Well, believe it or not, for lots of vaccines, the key ingredient is the virus itself. 
sounds strange, doesn't it? Why do you inject germs of the very disease you're trying to fight off? Well, they don't just inject any old germ. The bits of virus used in most vaccines are called weakened viruses because they have a much harder time quickly reproducing over and over again, which is how they make you sick. So the virus inside a vaccine is too weak to actually make you sick, but just strong enough that your body will notice and build up a hefty resistance to it. But that's not all. Your body also remembers to fight off the infection in the future. That's right. Your body will know how to fight the virus next time, having learned how to take it down. Measles, mumps, chickenpox, shingles, and several other terrible maladies used to plague much of the population, but have since been quashed by vaccines made using weakened viruses. Unfortunately, people with weakened immune systems usually can't take them because their body might not be able to fight back the weakened germs. But luckily, there is another type called an inactivated virus vaccine that can be given to just about anyone. In these shots, the virus has been completely killed, so it can't give you any of its disease, but your body will still fight back. Rabies, tetanus, hepatitis A, influenza, and lots of other vaccines have all been made using completely inactivated viruses. So while no one likes to get a shot and sometimes vaccines can seem strange and scary, the truth is they're quite safe and super effective at keeping us healthy. How does soap work? No one can say for sure when exactly humans first invented soap, but experts do have an idea of how we may have discovered it, and they think it was probably an accident. Sometime thousands of years ago in the ancient world, rain may have washed the ash and fat from cooked animals into a lake or river. This would have formed a natural soapy lather that can clean clothes and skin like nothing else. While we're likely never to know exactly how it happened, the discovery of soap would forever change human history. To this day, and even with all the state-of-the-art tech we have, soap is still the best defense humans have against germs, viruses, and general stickiness. Just a little bit of soap mixed with warm water has enough power to pulverize almost all the germs and viruses we carry on our skin. And it all works thanks to the strange shape of soap molecules. They look a little bit like a circular head attached to a curly pin. The head is hydrophilic, which means it easily attaches to water molecules. The tail is hydrophobic, which means it repels water and instead attaches itself to oils or fats. Every time you wash with soap and water, you surround the germs and viruses living on your skin with soap molecules. The tails of those molecules try to avoid the water at all costs and pry their way inside a germ or virus, ultimately ripping them apart as they try to avoid touching H2O. This slick discovery is up there with the wheel among the most important and long-lasting ancient inventions. In fact, it's hard to imagine what the modern world would look like without it. Or smell like. How do mirrors work? The truth is, mirrors are just as old as anything. Any smooth surface that can bounce back light can be used as a mirror. The very first mirrors used by humans would have been dark pools of still water that could reflect their face back at them. But how does that work? Why is it that smooth surfaces can reflect images back at us? It has to do with the way light hits a surface. You see, when light shines off an object, like your face, and hits a super smooth surface, the rays of light can all bounce back at the same exact angle. Our eyes perceive this perfectly reflected light as a mirror image, meaning it looks just like you, but backwards. Rough surfaces bounce back light at all different angles, so we don't get any mirror image at all. But not every smooth surface acts like a mirror. If the smooth surface absorbs the photons instead of bouncing them back, there's no reflection. 
The earliest known examples of ancient mirrors are more than 8,000 years old. Found in modern-day Turkey, these primitive mirrors were made out of a polished volcanic glass called obsidian. By 3000 BCE, mirrors of polished copper were available to the wealthy people of the Mediterranean, but they were prone to being blurry and regularly needed polishing. Modern mirrors were invented in the 1500s, when Venetian craftsmen started coating clear, even panes of glass with a thin layer of tin and mercury mixed together, which made for a near-perfect reflection that needed no polishing. Today, mirrors are made of manufactured glass that's been coated with either silver or aluminum on one side. Factory precision allows almost every mirror to perfectly reflect the image back, making it a bit less of an art. Unless, of course, you're lucky enough to make mirrors for a carnival funhouse. How is paint made? Humans have been using paints for a long time. Some of the oldest art ever found are cave paintings that are more than 44,000 years old. Our cave ancestors were scribbling their work on the walls with red and black pigment that came from whatever they could find that would leave behind colors. Rocks, charcoal, berries, or different minerals found in the soil. The earliest prehistoric cave paintings look like something you might find in a modern elementary school. It's a collage of hands stenciled onto the wall. Paint has changed plenty since we first lived in caves. People eventually discovered more colorful rocks, clays, and minerals in the earth and developed new ways to mine them and turn those raw rocks into powdery pigments. Paints of just about every color were available in the ancient world and they were slapped on everything. Armor, artwork, statues, murals, and buildings were all painted, making ancient Rome much more colorful than we imagine. Some colors were hard to make, and that made them highly valuable. Take Tyrian purple, for example. That's a reddish purple hue made from sea snails that was all the rage in the Roman world. The purple dye was made in the city of Tyr in modern-day Lebanon. No one knows exactly how it was made, but we do have a few stinky details. Tens of thousands of sea snails were collected in nets and left out to decompose in the sun, which didn't smell great. Besides the smell, it also apparently took lots of labor to turn the rotting snails into a purple dye. All of this work made the dye expensive and a way for someone to show just how rich they were. For centuries, paints remained popular, but were too expensive for common people to buy since it wasn't so easy to make them. But that all started to change around the time of the Industrial Revolution. New technologies made paint faster, easier, and much cheaper to produce. And by the late 1800s, the average person could walk into a store and buy paint at an affordable price in just about any color they wanted. Today, most paints are made using three main ingredients, a pigment, a resin, and a solvent. Pigments give paint its color, and resin helps the pigment stick together and fuse to the surface you're painting. The solvent is usually water or oil, and it helps keep the paint wet so clumps don't form and it goes on evenly. So next time you smell the stink of wet paint drying on a wall, at least you can take comfort in the fact that it doesn't smell as bad as 10,000 rotting sea snails. Ooh, and that's progress.